Since the time of the Reformation, the word holiness among Orthodox Protestants has been understood mainly as purity and transcendence. Throughout this series, we've seen that, on the contrary, holiness carries the core connotation of absolute devotion or consecration to God. And for God to be holy means that he is completely devoted to his people and his name. But today we want to address a couple objections and talk about how we can go forward from here with Bible translation. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Right. Well, right out of the gate, I want to just say, once again, this is not a comprehensive, exhaustive study of the word holy. And I really, really want to encourage people to get into this more deeply, share it more widely, and address some of the things that I haven't addressed. I'm I'm going to be really transparent that I have not gone through with you every single occurrence of the word holy in Leviticus, for example, and see how all of these different uses fit within our context that we've been talking about. So that needs to be done. I'm, I'm not going to say that this is the last word on the subject. I think we all need to approach these things with a lot of humility, especially when we're challenging something that's been held for 500 years or more. So I do want to set an example by saying, okay, we've done some work, but we haven't done all the work yet. And that needs to be done to before we're super, super dogmatic about this issue. Now, Costa Calda has done a lot more work than I have, but I think that one of the weaknesses of his dissertation in French is that he doesn't seem to address all of the problem passages that he could. So he needs to really dig into the objections and not just cherry pick the passages that really fit his argument. Of course, nowadays, it's really popular to come across as super confident and super dogmatic about new ideas or challenging other ideas, whatever it is. I see young guys on YouTube. I hear other guys on podcasts where they they come out with very strong statements or challenges to the status quo that often are not backed up by serious scholarship. And they might try to sell it to you as serious scholarship because they heard one smart person with a PhD say it once, and that was enough for them, but they didn't go and do their homework to verify those claims, and maybe they don't even have the, the capacity or the credentials or knowledge to actually do that homework. So I would say those kinds of things are exactly what we don't need within Christianity, because arguments boil down to a superficial food fight of whoever can yell the loudest, or even just a popularity contest. People with PhDs are just as fallible as anybody. They can be extremely driven by emotional motivations that often blind them to the evidence their own research produces. To take an example from the world of science, Albert Einstein was a prime example of someone who adamantly rejected the evidence before his eyes for the last half of his life. So after his groundbreaking work on the theory of relativity, a lot of work on quantum theory began to surface. And so scientists were having to do a complete paradigm shift in their view of the material universe because of quantum theory. Einstein did not like quantum theory. For the rest of his life, he kicked against it, and he basically dedicated years and years just trying to poke holes in it simply because he had this emotional reaction to it, an intense dislike of its nature and what he thought were its implications. And so he dedicated all of this energy just to 
undermining the facts that were in front of him simply because of some very odd presuppositions and emotions that he had that went against that discovery. So all of that to say, if this can happen with one of the smartest people that have ever lived, the icon of modern intelligence, then it can happen to anyone, and we need to be careful. Now let's get to the objections, shall we? One objection that arises is from 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 through 8. So let me read it. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So you can see there the contrast, right? He's not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So people would say, since there is a contrast between impurity and holiness, it would follow, obviously, that holiness means the opposite of impurity, right? Purity. And this could very well be so within this context, but it is not absolutely required. So in the definition that we've proposed in this whole series, that Holiness means, at its core, total devotion to God, especially when we're talking about us. Then, holiness here definitely contrasts with impurity. Devotion to God certainly includes purity, and I want everyone to hear that. (laughs) We're not saying that it never means that or could lead to that. It certainly includes purity and a lot more. Just as devotion to God includes love and all of those things. So, in other words, Paul would be contrasting something much greater and comprehensive than purity for effect. In essence, he might be saying something like, How can you allow yourselves to engage in something so base as impurity when God has called you to so much more? All out devotion to Him. So, An example of this style of writing in Paul can be found in 2 Timothy 1.7. So, this is what it says. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So, there's that contrast, the same word Allah again in Greek to contrast it, but of power and love and self-control. So, This is the same contrast that is used in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 that we just looked at. But it's obvious that he is not implying that power or love are the technical opposites of fear slash timidity, which is the translation of delias in Greek, nor that delias is the opposite, the direct opposite of self-control. So let me read that again. God gave us a spirit. Not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So all that to say that when we read 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 through 8, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness, it doesn't necessarily imply that holiness is the direct technical opposite of impurity. Now, once again, if you are totally devoted to God, Purity will certainly be one of the results of being totally devoted to God, but it just isn't the core meaning of the word holy. Now, I think it would be interesting and helpful to go back and read a larger chunk of 1 Thessalonians 4 to get the broader context around these two verses that we just looked at. And I think this is important because it is a passage about sanctification and what sanctification implies. And as you know, sanctification has at its root the word to become holy, you know, holiness. And so, if we're to be sanctified, we have to understand what holiness means before we strive towards sanctification. And so, let's try to read this thinking through our new understanding this new lenses of our understanding of holiness meaning total devotion to God. So, here's what Paul writes. Finally then, brothers, 
we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, and not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So that was 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12. And you can see here, Paul working up to this larger perspective of total devotion to God, which is God's will for them, their sanctification. So he's basically saying, why should you be fooling around with impurity, with lust, like the Gentiles, these small base things, when you're called to something much greater, total devotion. And he even says in verse four, that Each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So if you're controlling your body in holiness, total devotion to God and honor, it's going to be really different from the passion of lust of the Gentiles. Now let's go on to another objection. This objection is not as serious as others, but let's talk about it. Luke 1 35. This is the whole scene of the angel announcing to Mary that she will bear the Messiah. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So in this context, Mary has just asked how it would be possible for her to bear a child since she is a virgin. So it appears that the angel is emphasizing that her child, though born out of wedlock, will not be the product of an unclean relationship. Rather, he will be pure or holy. That's how some serious Bible scholars would argue. Now, the context, however, does not require this perspective. A more compelling interpretation to me is that Mary simply wonders how she will have a baby without physical union with a man. The angel gives a simple answer that the Holy Spirit will make her conceive. And since he will make her conceive, the child himself will also be holy like God's Spirit. So the logical result of being associated with the Holy Spirit's work in the conception, is for the one that's born to be holy. So, in other words, if the child is going to be the son of a holy God, he also will be called holy. So, what I'm getting at is that purity is not necessarily the issue in the text. Rather, it is of relation to God and being the one who will manifest God's full and fully committed character on earth. So, you know, this this makes total sense when you think about the work of Jesus. When you think about the advent of Jesus, what does it communicate? It communicates an overarching full commitment of God 
to his covenant promises to his people, his love and total devotion to his people. So, this work of the Holy Spirit in making Mary conceive shows God's total devotion to his people in providing a Messiah to save his people from their sins. So, after looking at those objections, I know I should look at about 50 objections if this is to to be completely compelling, but uh, I'm going to leave that to some of you to do, so I'll look forward to reading your articles. (laughs) But we mentioned at the beginning of this paper, you know, this is about Bible translation at the end of the day, right? This podcast We want to know what to do now with this knowledge. If this is correct, how are we going to move forward in Bible translation, especially in contexts where, you know, outside of the English-speaking world? I will give you a little anecdote. I was in Cameroon uh, quite a few years ago and in the Northwest area, which is the Anglophone area, and I got to shadow a handful of translation projects that were going on both with Seed Company and Wycliffe and and SIL, all of them together helping with these projects. And it was interesting because I got to see how the word holy was usually translated in these people groups. Now, these were people groups that were not new to Christianity. And so what that means is that a lot of the key terms that you use in church, you know, like holiness— had already been decided on and been ingrained in their traditions by missionaries a hundred years ago or 50 years ago or whatever who had come there. And so when you're going up against tradition with a new Bible translation, so they didn't have a Bible yet, but they had Christian tradition, right? Well, you as the consultant or the translator, whoever you are helping with this translation, you don't really have a lot of say in changing the tide there. It doesn't really matter how much you know or how much the translators are convinced of your opinion about a certain word and how it should be translated. Tradition is usually going to win out. That's just the hard facts because, man, it's really hard to change a whole community's perception and usage of a word and a term that is so core to central aspects of Christianity. Now, we as North Americans should not be surprised at this because we are probably more crazy about tradition than a lot of other people in the world. 70 years ago, when the RSV first came out, there was a pastor who got so angry about them saying in Isaiah 7:14, "...behold, a young woman shall conceive." and bear a son, uh, instead of a virgin. So they translated Alma as young woman because the scholars were convinced by the research at the time that it was more accurate to say young woman there. So because of that one verse, a pastor publicly burned, took a blowtorch and burned a copy of the new RSV and then also mailed the ashes of that translation to Bruce Metzger, who was the head of the translation committee. So imagine what kind of uproar there would be if we changed the word holy in our Bibles, right? So that's not going to happen anytime soon in the U.S. or in the English-speaking world. But once in a blue moon, missionaries and translators have the opportunity to change the tide based on more accurate studies and information. And so, An alternative way forward, yeah, is to be more helpful in a translation of holy and avoid using pure or clean. So in in Cameroon, all across the board, people were saying clean spirit for Holy Spirit. It was the clean spirit or the pure spirit. Now, when we talk about Bible translations, there's this term we throw around sometimes called perceived authenticity. Perceived authenticity. So, One of the marks that we want on Bible translations, new Bible translations where they've never had a Bible translation before, or even a revision where they've had a Bible translation before, is the aspect of perceived authenticity. Do the people who are going to be using it perceive it as authentic? Does it come across as an authentic word of God? 
an authentic translation. And one of the elements that plays into that is the question, does this Bible use language that we are used to hearing from the people that we trust? Our pastors, our leaders, maybe the guys we see on TV preaching, I don't know. But are they using those same kinds of words and language that we have already heard trustworthy people establish? And if it doesn't, that Bible, even though people may on the surface look excited about it and say nice things about it, at the end of the day, it may just sit on a shelf and not get used by the majority. So once again, once the translation of a name is established, especially a name so pervasive and primal as Holy Spirit, it's exceedingly difficult to reverse the decision. So as in all cases with translation of key terms, Best practice involves letting the community make an informed decision and test it amongst themselves. And in all probability, communities who already use terms such as clean or pure spirit will opt to maintain them even after gaining a better understanding. So in those cases, it may be helpful to encourage them to include a clarifying discussion of what it means for God to be holy in a glossary or a footnote. So there's one solution. Now, at the same time, there are other cultures who have not actually translated the word holy, and they've just used holy to stand in as a loan word from English or some other language like French. This actually happened a lot in the Benga language of the island of Corisco off the coast of Gabon and Equatorial Guinea. And uh, I worked on revising their translation of Luke that had been done back in the 18, I want to say 70s or something like that. And that had happened a lot with that missionary community. So these missionaries had come from Pennsylvania. They were Presbyterians and did a lot of amazing work on that island and parts of the mainland. But it was obvious that their translation into Benga, which a lot of them learned to speak very fluently, Uh, were done by non-native speakers who had used the King James Version as their, their text, their base text, instead of the Greek. My theory is that a guy with the last name Nassau, who actually we have a lot of his journals, they're in the public domain now, you can read, they're fascinating about his time in Central Africa. But I think that's what happened. And so a lot of loan words from English ended up in that translation. So what do you do in that case? Well, I think that there can be corrective teaching on the term. So over time, with enough corrective teaching, that term can come to mean another word since really it was a loan word to begin with. Now, in the English-speaking world, as I've already said, we are stuck with holy forever. All right? <laughs> there's, no, there's no way we're going back. Every man, woman, and child will burn their Bible version that has a different word for holy or a different phrase for holy if that happens, right? So what can we do? Well, the same thing. You know, pastors, leaders, writers can begin to turn the tide, like I'm trying to do in this podcast, towards a better understanding of the term. Because honestly, at the end of the day, most people don't really understand what the word holy means anyway, because it's not a word we use in everyday life. It's a religious term, so it stands more of a chance to get tweaked a little bit in our understanding, in our heads. So, yeah, likewise, other cultures can begin to resurrect the biblical meaning through offering wise guidance in their congregations. Now, the challenge will be in pioneering contexts where no church or Christian terminology has already been established, the challenge will then be how to communicate this single abstract term, devoted or dedicated or consecrated, which may be lacking in these languages, some kind of equivalent to that. It's not always that easy. And so, let's talk about some creative or compelling ways to communicate the concept. My take is that even the translation, faithful spirit, would be closer to the meaning than pure, pure spirit. Committed would be better than separate or blameless. But at the end of the day, it should be clearly understood that finding a viable alternative for translation will be a difficult challenge in many languages. 
I totally recognize that. It is not an easy answer now that you have a better definition. Now, although our devotion to God will involve separating ourselves from certain things and striving to be blameless, they are not equal concepts. Just as loving one's wife is not the same as avoiding pornography, even though it should include that. You get what I'm saying? We cannot equate the two. We cannot say, well, I avoid pornography. That's all I do. So therefore, I am, I am loving my wife. <laughs> it takes a little more than that. It takes a lot more than that. So the one is positive and the other negative. So what we want to communicate is the positive and fundamental aspect of holiness, wherein God pours himself out for the good of his people and people offer their hands and hearts to God and his glory. Now, when missionaries or translators are working in pioneering contexts where some of these words have to be dug up, you know, they, they have to figure out, okay, what's the best way for me to elicit the mother tongue speakers to think of the right word, right? So there's a lot of creative ways to do this. And usually it involves painting a picture, giving a situation. Okay, so what would you say in this situation? If somebody did this, well, then what, you, what, what would you call it? And I do that a lot when I'm consulting. So what could we do with the term holiness? Well, you could tell a story of a father or a mother in some cultures who was totally devoted to the well-being of his children or of a husband who was totally devoted to the welfare of his wife. Now, of course, you would have to know the culture. You'd have to know a lot about the culture to be able to communicate that idea. So what are the actions in that culture that would demonstrate a total radical devotion to the well-being of his children or his wife, etc.? So after choosing these culturally appropriate examples of how the man went above and beyond the normal call of duty because of his devotion, then you could ask, what would you call this man? What was he like? And this would open up a potentially valuable discussion that may unveil the right word or phrase. It may not, (laughs) but that's the challenge. Ultimately, God's manifestation of his covenantal character in action towards humanity, his people in particular, and his people manifesting the covenantal character of God in their lives, that is holiness, complements our understanding of the gospel. And that's what I love about this. God poured out the life of his son as a demonstration not only of his righteousness, as we see in Romans 3.25, but also to show his holiness. Jesus himself was obedient unto death for his father's chosen ones. And thus, it's not a surprise that he is referred to by the quaking demons as the Holy One of God, Mark 1, 24. And it is the Holy Spirit who manifests God's holiness through the gospel, enabling people to understand it bringing them to embrace it, and empowering them to live it. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey of discovery and learning new things together. This is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And my hope is that this podcast be a place where you and I can delight and treasure the Bible together, go deeper into it, and ultimately become more like the man of Psalm 1.